Welcome back to MACNA 2021. Our next speaker, Vincent Chalias, has been in Indonesia for over 23 years. He's been behind the first Indonesian commercial mariculture operation, Bali Aquarium. Here to speak to us at MACNA 2021 about Indonesian coral industry, has anything changed, is Vincent. Vincent, welcome to MACNA 2021. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for allowing me to, uh, to talk again in MACNA. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so basically, you know, um, I've been asked to talk about the, uh, what happened in the aquarium industry the last uh, few years. Um, I don't want this talk to be interpreted as a, as a long, big rant. Uh, but there is some few things that needs to be said and, and trying to deny, to deny all the issues is, is, is not the proper way forward, you know. So I don't want people to get offended. Uh, my only goal, you know, in saying all this is to get things moving forward and in the right direction. So, so that's the main thing. Um, so, yeah, so it's a little bit uh, challenging because there is a lot of criticizing into this, going into this talk. And, uh, and yeah, and uh, I'll try to maybe another time, you know, to talk a bit more about all the positive sides of uh, the aquarium industry, you know, but I'm sure, you know, already many people, you know, are mentioning them. All right, so let's get going, you know. So, um, so let's start by a, a little bit of uh, history background. Uh, what happened uh, in the last three years in our industry? You know? So all of you know that uh, Indonesia uh, was shut down in 2018. Uh, it was shut down for two years and it reopened in uh, the beginning of uh, 2020 or the end of uh, 2019 officially, you know. But yeah, uh, for two years, there was no coral exported all of Indonesia. And uh, since the beginning of last year, it has reopened. Uh, the Hawaii fish industry is, was completely shut down uh, this year again. It's uh, still uh, a long going battle to try to reopen it, um, but uh, it's gonna take a long time. Um, then the Fiji, the Fiji, it's also in trouble, you know, they're still not able, you know, to export coral properly. And um, when you will look at what's going on in Australia, there is a new set of regulation, which is, uh, I don't have all the details, you know, but is coming forward, you know. So we can see that uh, everywhere, even the most health, the healthiest uh, fishery, like in Hawaii, uh, is under threat. And uh, yeah, so we have a lot of people trying to shut us down. And, uh, and uh, so that's why we need to, to work hard to make this industry better. So it's uh, not easy to attack. So what happened in Indonesia the last three years, you know, so we back in business. Um, the first thing is that uh, it was only political. Uh, basically, there was a that uh, didn't like this industry and uh, just decided to shut it down. Uh, she used even some very dodgy ways to shut it down. And uh, um, she managed to do it. So, uh, so now two years ago, uh, there was some election, presidential election, the former president got reelected and he has to change his cabinet and it ch changes fishery minister and uh, with the new fishery minister everything we're back in business everything was, was open again and uh, we could work again so wild and my culture you know reopened last year what they did is uh, to add uh, an additional layer of bureaucracy so basically in indonesia uh, because of uh, cyclist permit and most of the animals that depend on the cyclist permit, which are elephant or kids or, or rhinoceros, etc., etc., depend on the forestry department because they are the only minister to have a management authority. So what they did when they reopened, you know, they give more power to the fisheries department, the fisheries minister, and um, apparently the fish his minister is trying to get uh, his own management authority and probably in the future that uh, the site permit will be issued by the fisheries minister and uh, we will probably deal mostly with the fisheries department instead of the forestry department you know so basically at the moment we have to follow the regulation the audit everything 
from two ministers, so from the forestry and, and the fisheries. You know? So there is a, an enormous quantity of paperwork to be done. Uh, so we have one additional controlling body that is supervising us. But um, as a lot of, uh, as often it happens in, uh, in third world country, uh, they don't have the resources to, uh, to have enough staff on the ground. So there is a, a lack of control and implementation. They cannot be everywhere. They cannot check everything. So there is not enough people on the ground, which is actually implementing all those regulations. Okay, so uh, basically the, so the mariculture and wild coral have been open in Indonesia. Uh, the wild coral, it's still in a very mysterious way. We don't know if it's gonna be open or not. Uh, it's also a political issue, you know? So basically, if there is a change of government, you know, everything can happen, everything can be reopened and cleared and everything. But right now, it's not really clear what's gonna happen with the, with the wild coral. So there is, um, there is, it has been put on a negative list for investment. Uh, so it's basically not possible to have a, a license to export wild calls at the moment. Uh, so the quota are pending. There is a lot of confusion going on between the investment board, the forestry department and the fisheries department. Uh, Whatever happened, it looks like it would probably be blocked by the fisheries, at least the fisheries department or the investment board. We don't know. Uh, so at the moment, it's very blur if uh, the wild coral from Indonesia is going to be open or not. Uh, the domestic trade is badly regulated. We will talk about it. You know, we start to have a market in Indonesia of people having aquariums, but um, all the corals, which are for the domestic market, are completely unregulated. Um, only the export trade is properly regulated. Uh, and among the Indonesian population, you start to have a, a negative social perception about uh, the, the, the collection of uh, wild corals. So it's hard to say, you know, what's going to happen, you know, if uh, they're going to manage to open it or not. We'll see. Uh, so what changed in the mariculture export from Indonesia? You know? So finally, you know, we could, uh, we could uh, uh, get reward for our work and, uh, and, and the price went up as soon as it opened. Uh, so finally, you know, the price were pretty good. So immediately after reopening, you know, the price were up. But unfortunately, with more and more uh, people getting back into the business, you know, the price are, are going down. Uh, and it's unfortunate because uh, my culture requires a lot of risky investment and uh, having low margin creates problems. Uh, um, it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of regulation. And uh, if you start to take shortcut, you know, it's, it's, it's never in a good way. Uh, the regulation which are surrounding all the my culture is very stiff and very complicated to comply with which in a very flexible market, like uh, the coral market, which is very trendy, it's very difficult to adapt quickly. And um, so if there is less margin, there is no more funding for proper management, for research, data collection, for lobbying. Uh, plus um, we try to work with the fisheries department on some different research projects. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, because of all the money that is spent for COVID, there is no more money going on into research. So all the research programs which were on corals have been, uh, I mean, not all, but many of them, you know, have been stopped. So, which is very a pity. Um, so keeping price uh, down is not healthy for this industry, you know, and it won't be able to finance improvement in that industry. So are we back to business as usual? So what happened is that uh, now all the corals that uh, are shipped from Indonesia must be tagged and uh, they must be photographed and uh, sent to the fisheries department before each uh, shipment. So all the corals which are ready to go 
uh, are photographed and uh, sent to the fisheries department as evidence of everything that was shipped. Uh, because of the pandemic, the last audit was virtual. Uh, I prefer to have people in the water and seeing exactly what's going on. Um, so AV bureaucracy is not, in, what, is not enough, unfortunately, without proper enforcement. So there is still a lack of control, you know. So, so even doing the virtual audit is not the best solution. It's, uh, it's important that we have more people that are going down on the farms and checking what's going on on the farms more regularly. Uh, Importers must play their role, you know, so they, they are the one, you know, which are actually, you know, pushing, I mean, it's a market which is pushing the price down, you know, but uh, importers also are trying to push the price down as much as possible to be competitive. Uh, because business is, is, is good. So exporters are too busy with business, uh, heavy bureaucracy and freight to really assess the problem that we're facing right now, you know? So uh, yeah, everybody's busy with the own business and, and don't really take care of, uh, of uh, the improvement that we need to, uh, to make in this industry. And then now we have uh, a, a lot of unregulated small farmer, you know, that uh, just uh, collect coral and glue them. They don't have woodstock. Uh, they start gluing, you know, not sexually reproductible corals. Um, so yeah, that's, there, is, there is a few issues, you know, we'll talk about it later, you know, but we see more and more corals which have been freshly glued. Uh, that, that's a problem, you know, because SPS should, should spend at least four to six months in the water and LPS should spend at least eight to 10 months, you know? So when you get a coral that is shipped and uh, the glue is, uh, is still new. There is no algae growing on it. There is nothing growing on it. It's, it's very suspicious and it's a shortcut, you know, that we shouldn't be taking. So we start to get some, uh, some seizures again, you know. So there is uh, more and more stories. There is some corals which are seized. We can see here, you know, that's of course torches, you know, which are the the most problematic coral at the moment because the demand is and the price is just are just too high. So the problem you have with seizure is that yeah, so the price going down, you know, drives irregularities. The prosecution is always difficult to find uh, who is really behind it. So it's a lot of small offenses. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, damage to the environment is always difficult to prove uh, because you don't know where the coral are coming from. So it's hard to. Uh, to, uh, to process the, the environmental damage. So at the end of the day, there is never any real prosecution on this, uh, on this uh, matter, on this seizure, you know? Always the associations, you know, protect these members, which is normal. So there is not really any risk at the moment of uh, getting, uh, getting uh, stopped, you know? Uh, it's very seldom that they actually, um, stop one exporter to export or, or one farmer to actually, you know, sell his, his, his call, you know, so, so there is never any uh, sanctions, really. Uh, I see this very often, I right know. Um, a lot of wild corals are actually uh, glued on base. And, uh, and they, are, they are shipped with a wild cyclist permit, so there is absolutely uh, no irregularity with that, you know, but it brings a little bit of confusion, you know, so, so confusion between wild corals shipped on the base and uh, my culture corals. So are those corals my culture? I don't know, no, they're wild, but because they are shipped on the base, you know, so there is a, a misconception, you know, a confusion possible between my culture and uh, wild corals. Uh, and then people get used to see that, you know, so they don't mind, you know, if the coral is newly glued. Uh, the bays are perfectly clean, so there is no cutting marks, so they are shipped using a white cyclist pyramid, so which is totally legal. And, but it feeds the confusion, you know, uh, toward, uh, in collectors and farmers, you know, uh, about, yeah, the difference between wild and myculture corals. Uh, Indonesia is a third world country, you know, so, so they have uh, different priorities. So uh, 
there is a difference. There is a, a huge gap actually between Western values and third world priorities. You know, so uh, sometimes messages which are very uh, easy to get through, you know, in uh, Western culture are very difficult to get through here. Um, so one of the things is uh, you always, I mean, we always have to explain to uh, to uh, fishermen, you know, why uh, they have to maintain good stock when the sea is full of it. So I see many uh, small operations just don't have any good stock because they consider that, uh, yeah, the sea is a good stock. So, so whenever they need some cuttings, you know, they just have to go out there and take some cuttings and, 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 and wrench them. Uh, so the, they don't know that there is, the, I don't know, the fisheries, the forestry, you know, the administration, the, the company behind them. There is nobody, you know, which is actually pushing, you know, to the idea, you know, that they have to maintain good stock and, uh, and uh, a lot of operations don't have good stock. Uh, they have this, this, as all fishermen, you know, they have this, uh, this idea, you know, that if I don't take it, someone else will. And yeah, the most populated island in the world, like Java, you know, have other priority, you know, like crash management, overfishing, malnourishment. Now they have, uh, they have uh, big problems with COVID, you know, so no access to vaccine and, uh, and a very limited access to vaccine. So they have many other more important priorities that actually are protecting the environment. So, uh, it's uh, it's always easy, you know, to uh, to uh, blame uh, small fishermen in a remote island, you know, in a third world country, you know. But actually, uh, I think the problems is it doesn't come from there. So uh, uh, the the coral market is a very particular market. It's a it's a market driven by trends. So the only trendy corals have decent value, you know. So I know it's torches, everybody wants torches and they are ready to pay enormous amount of money to get torches. So, so yeah, so that creates, you know, I mean, there is, there is a, a certain quantity of coral that have been planted eight, 10 months before that can be harvested every month. And, and this quantity cannot be transformed, but the demand is higher that this quantity, you know, so this creates a huge demand, a huge price, and uh, yeah, it creates, uh, yeah, some people will be uh, ready to uh, take risk because uh, the reward, the money, the financial reward, you know, behind it is, is, is sufficient to take those risks. Uh, so it's one of the problem, you know, so obviously, you know, you can only run a business, uh, a mariculture business, if you only, if you have the few coral that are trendy and expensive. If you don't have those pieces, you just don't ship because all the other value, all the other corals have no value all of a sudden. So at the moment, if uh, we try to make shipments without any uh, Acropora tenuis, without any uh, Euphilia Gabansan's gold torch, then there are no shipments. Nobody wants a shipment without any tenuis. Nobody wants a shipment without any gold torch. That's all they want. They want tenuis and gold torch. There is 1,400 different species of coral. You know, why we only stick on two species? This is ridiculous. And, um, but yeah, that's, that's a fact, you know. So uh, the problem we have is my culture is a slow producing method. It takes two years, as I said before, two years minimum to produce a new LPS and one year to produce the SPS. The bureaucracy process behind this is even longer than that. So we need to be ahead of those trends and the, anticip the anticipation is, is sometimes uh, difficult. So sudden market popularity drives high demand and the demand creates the supply, the market is driving the industry. So uh, it's always difficult when the demand and the price are so high so for few particular species and everybody will look for those particular species. Uh, but it's not only uh, the responsibility of, uh, of the market because there is some people that influence uh, uh, the market. There is some few, some few things. 
uh, that's a personal opinion. You know, I, I, I think that um, new equipment, especially LEDs, are a, a species bottleneck. Because if you take the latest blue LEDs, and then not all coral will look great under those LEDs, you know. So, so right now, why uh, Tenuis, Acropora Tenuis is so popular is because it's one of the few Acropora that really look better under blue light. And why the gold torch is so popular right now? Because it's one color, one coral that looks fantastic under blue light. And uh, and unfortunately, you know, those those equipment are, are bottleneck. They they just narrow down the very wide availability of corals, you know, to just only a few. Uh, the problem we have now is uh, I look a, a lot of I look at a lot of uh, videos on YouTube, you know, from uh, influencers and uh, and uh, they just follow the trend. They don't try to produce anything outside the box. They just, uh, yeah, they just follow and, and just try to make tank full of gold torch or tank full of penuries and then show off all of this instead of trying to do uh, something with deep water acropora or with white light and some, uh, some very shallow uh, Acropora uh, humilis, Acropora gemifera, robusta, brotanoides, which are very colorful. Uh, the Jones, nobody's tried to do something different. Every, peop, every influencer are pushing for the same thing. So at the end of the day, everybody wants the exact same cause. It brings the price up, the production can keep up, and then we have some, some problems. One thing that I really hate about uh, blue LEDs is that most of the fish look gray under blue LEDs, you know? So it's not only driving the, 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 the coral market down, it's also uh, driving the, the fish market down. So at the end of the day, people want only fluorescent yellow or red coral or red corals. They want nothing else. That's, that's a shame. Um, so uh, right now in Indonesia, we have uh, two uh, different associations with different vision. You know, one is only for my culture. The other one is for wild, my culture, curious. Uh, their main mission is to protect member. You know, it's fair enough because it's a member that, that found them. Um, I feel that they prioritize the statu quo. And um, yeah, and uh, they're just trying to keep the, the industry open. They're not trying to get the industry to change. So it's very slow in promoting changes. You know, there is still, I, I still feel that our industry, you know, still have a long way to do, to go. And there is still a lot of things that can be developed in this industry. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, those association, you know, actually just try to just leave it open and, uh, and uh, yeah, not promote, not promote changes. I understand changes are difficult. Uh, and um, when the business is good, then the lobbying drops and, uh, and uh, we're too busy, you know, uh, doing business. So we don't have time, you know, to actually uh, lobby for changes. But there is still a lot of things, you know, that uh, those industry could be working on. Uh, so, uh, one thing that uh, I always try to promote is uh, education of uh, staff, of uh, officers, auditors. So uh, trying to, to make uh, coral training, species identification training, trying to train uh, people about all the, the procedure you have to uh, do to farm corals. Uh, the whole philosophy behind it, it's all about education. And I think there is nothing really done right now to educate uh, the staff of uh, forestry or fisheries department, uh, uh, staff that could be auditing all the different companies uh, uh, and even company staff, you know. So there is no real proper uh, training in this industry, you know, for all the, all the different players, you know. And it's something I think the association should be working on. Another idea is um, so custom function with uh, what they call HS code, you know, which is harmonized system code. And uh, there is only one HS code for calls, and there is no 
different code for wild corals and cultured corals. And I uh, sincerely think that they should be on different codes. And uh, if they would have been on different codes, uh, while the, the Indonesian coral were banned, uh, cultured corals could have been treated. Um, in Indonesia, there are no regulation on domestic supply and market. So basically, uh, if uh, one farmer wants to sell a coral to a local pet shop, he has to produce the same, almost the same paperwork as an export cyclist permit. So basically to sell a few pieces of coral to a local shop, the cost of bureaucracy is just crazy. And yeah, there is a problem. This needs to be solved, you know, because there are a lot of corals which are circulating on the country uh, to supply this domestic market and nothing is done to stop that and nothing is done to at least regulate that properly. And um, if, like I see in Australia, the, um, the, all the collectors supply the local shops. Uh, in Indonesia, that's not the way. It's fishermen uh, supplying uh, unlicensed, most of the time unlicensed fishermen, you know, uh, supplying uh, local shops. And uh, I think the local shops should get their calls from exporters. But the regulation needs to be reduced, you know, so it's easy to supply uh, 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 domestic shops. Uh, there is still a lot of research in uh, spawning patterns. You know, we need to know, you know, what species, how does it spawn, when does it spawn, how does it grow, how fast, if there is some season, you know, where it's growing faster or not, if there is some special condition, you know, which are uh, better for growing those corals, uh, some treatment protocols. Right now, there is a lot of uh, problems with the uh, torches and uh, it looks like it's a it's a it's a ciliate or it's a protozoan or it's a bacteria you know but uh, we could set up some treatments you know to actually avoid you know all the problems we have with torches and um, nothing is done regarding this i think uh, the the association should be uh, pushing to do some research about that uh, it's sometimes difficult to, uh, the nomenclature of course is going very fast, especially at the moment. It's changing every month. There is a, a genus which are changed to new genus. There is species, new species, et cetera, et cetera. You know, unfortunately, uh, all the paperwork behind, you know, doesn't follow fast enough. So it's, uh, it's, it's very complicated to actually use the proper scientific name if, uh, if the, all the bureaucracy and the administration behind, you know, uh, is far behind and use name that were used 10 years ago, you know, so it's, it's difficult if we don't call things uh, their proper names. So, yeah, so um, I feel like uh, they try to find a bureaucratic solution to every problem. Unfortunately, it's, it's not the way it works. Uh, it doesn't work on the world. It's not because you have to document everything. It's not because you have to, 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 to fill up paperwork for anything you want to do that you're going to solve all the procedure uh, and uh, making the paperwork more and more complicated uh, doesn't solve everything because if you want to set up farms in very uh, remote area with people that have poor education, they just cannot fill up this paperwork. They don't have uh, the education necessary to fill up this paperwork, so so they just don't want to, they just don't want to fill it up. So they prefer to sell coral illegally, you know, that actually you know try to set up everything properly and do all the paperwork, you know. So trying to to put a lid of paperwork on any problem, you know, is not really the solution because it doesn't work with uh, with population which are not properly educated. So 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 making the, the, the paperwork easier would probably help a lot uh, to set up farms in remote area, you know, with people which not great uh, education, you know, but great knowledge about corals and diving and, and uh, where those corals grow and, and where they should be farmed, etc., cetera, et cetera, you know. So they are the people that have the knowledge to actually farm the corals, but they don't have the knowledge to fill the paperwork. 
and that's a shame. Um, we, I said before, you know, that it's a very trendy market, you know, that is always evolving, you know, and uh, to have very heavy bureaucration uh, doesn't allow a fast adaptation, you know, so this slows down the whole process. All right. So on the other side, I think the importing, the importers should also do their, their share because uh, even if everything is properly regulated, there is still a lot of things uh, on the other side which are not really well uh, regulated. So if in the modern countries uh, like the US or Europe, you know, it's, it's pretty good. It's, uh, there is uh, enough uh, work done to make sure there is no, not so much irregularities, you know. Unfortunately, it's not the case around the world. There are other countries where uh, because of a lack of education, because of a lack of political will or whatever the reason, you know, there is not so much control, you know, so, so some of the countries, you know, are open door to anything. Um, so I think the trade association on the, important, on the importing side should be more active. Um, like for example, there is no active association in Asian importing countries. So apart from OFI, which is an international uh, association, if you look um, in Asia, in China, in, uh, in Japan, in Korea, in Singapore, I don't think there is any uh, active association uh, working uh, to, to regulate all this. Uh, so you have association like OFI, uh, which is great, you know, but unfortunately it's fresh water, it's... Uh, Marines, it's wild collection, it's culture, it's everything. So it's 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 protecting people with different agendas. So so it's it's difficult. The the the, the collection or the culture of a marine organism has his own agenda and his own specifics that uh, is hard to um, to. Uh, to regulate properly, you know, when you are not from that particular industry. So, so it doesn't help to have a association, you know, that they are deal with all kinds of pets. Uh, we need uh, people, you know, with, uh, which are more specific to our industry. Uh, one interesting fact uh, that uh, uh, they talk a lot is, uh, right now due to the pandemic so for example in bali the airport is closed the international airport is closed the domestic is still open so there are no more international flights so in order to ship out exporter needs to ship to jakarta first and then it's exported so there are less flights there are less connections the freight rate has been through the roof uh, in the last year and um, we have bad connection, longer flights, so we need to put more water with higher freight. So the shipping costs have been through the roof in the, in the past year due to COVID. The risk is much higher. Uh, and of course, you know, the people that have to reduce their price and, uh, and take the heat is most of the time are the exporters uh, or the producer. So, so we cannot wait to have uh, some kind of normal freight again and uh, be able to work, you know, more easily. So sometimes it takes, I mean, to get a, a shipment um, confirmed on one airline, you know, you have to book a month in advance now, while uh, two years ago you could book a week before and get the space. But now it's very difficult to get the space. It's longer connection, higher freight rate. You have to put more water. Everything makes it so much more risky and, and, and more expensive. All right, so that's, that's we're gonna talk about uh, something a little bit more positive, you know? So, so uh, that's something I enjoyed very much the last two years is that um, there is a few uh, projects uh, industry-based that uh, happen in Indonesia. So uh, about, uh, when is it? Six months ago? No, a bit more. Uh, nine, 10 months ago, it started in November last year. There was a big project here in Bali 
where um, they had to, uh, so the government basically gave money to, uh, to employ people that lost their job due to the pandemic. And, um, and uh, so the aquarium industry uh, stepped up and, uh, and uh, took care of a few of those projects. And a lot of corals were planted in Bali, in the south of Bali, and in the north of Bali. Um, there is this association, Ocean Gardener, that uh, does a lot of restoration and education work. Uh, some of the association have also their own project in different parts of Bali, and together with the fisheries department. So at the moment, there are a lot of corals which are planted by the by the coral industry, which is uh, which is a great news because uh, this is. Uh, this is something they can do. This is something they have uh, the know-how, and uh, and yeah, and uh, they know how to work on the water. They know where coral go, and uh, they can help a lot. So yeah, so it's something very positive, you know. Uh, I know some of the exporters even started to uh, to produce some corals specially for reef restoration because uh, obviously the coral that are used or that are produced for aquariums is not exactly the coral that you need for reef restoration. So some of the farmers, they start to produce coral, basically brown corals that uh, are very useful for reef restoration. You know? so, so, so the industry is changing and the industry is stepping up and, and, and that's really a, a good thing. Uh, and I say at the beginning of, uh, of the talk that um, there were still a lot of things to develop in this industry and, uh, and uh, few people are, are going forwards uh, in Indonesia or in Australia, all around the world. There's a lot of things going on right now with coral. A lot of people are passionate with coral. A lot of people want to work with coral. And, uh, and I think uh, this industry is just at the bottom of where it should be. Uh, so the coral culture potential have been barely scratched. So we're just starting to produce uh, land farms uh, in Indonesia or in Australia. Uh, collectors or farmers, they start to grow corals in land farms. So those corals, they are already adapted to uh, the light, aquarium light and all the aquarium conditions. So they're not going to lose their color. They have a better survival. And, uh, and, and a lot of corals go pretty fast and pretty well uh, in aquarium conditions. So this is something that uh, needs to be stepped up. Right now in Indonesia, the, 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 the regulation is basically the same as my culture. And uh, I don't think it should be the same as my culture because uh, we're talking about micro fragmentation and not fragmentation, you know, so out of one mother colony, you produce a lot more fragments and uh, the survival is better. And uh, the size where you sell them, is also smaller, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's a different, uh, different approach, you know, and I, should, I don't think it should be regulated the same way. Um, uh, sexual reproduction is something that have not yet been explored. There is only few companies in Australia that have started working on it, you know. But in Indonesia, it's it's really it's in uh, its infancy. Uh, so a lot of research should be, and a lot of money should be investing invested in uh, in um, in trying to uh, to sexually reproduce all those corals, uh, all those corals, so especially now. If uh, the wild collection is uh, is stopped in Indonesia, maybe it will give incentive to uh, produce all those species that cannot be collected anymore. So all those uh, species of uh, trachyphilias, of uh, cinarinas, acanthophilias that cannot be produced by mariculture, that cannot be produced by commercially produced by fragmentation, uh, need to be produced by uh, sexual reproduction, you know. So hopefully, you know, maybe once uh, the wild collection uh, saga is over, you know, on or off, I, I don't care the result, you know, I just want, uh, I just want it to be over. So we can move on, you know, and start working and, and move forward. Uh, maybe some money will be invested into uh, yeah, sexual reproduction, you know. So uh, right now, because of this wild, uh, issue. Uh, there is no broodstock quota. So all the farmers cannot collect new broodstock and start to farm new species. That It has been a problem in Indonesia and this should be released and this is all due to the wild collection situation. 
There is other option like a larval collection that has not yet been explored. Uh, we start to know now when coral are spawning and we could be collecting larvae and uh, raise them and uh, without having to maintain the broodstock or anything, just by a uh, by, uh, few night session, uh, properly timed, we could, uh, we could collect larvae and, uh, and raise those larvae and raise millions of whatever corals we need. Uh, Unfortunately, the knowledge regarding many corals, like you take trachyphilia, for example, uh, there is one Japanese guy that uh, Koji is gonna do a talk with, uh, or has done a talk with, but uh, that has been uh, successfully uh, reproducing them. Uh, but we don't know much about their biology. There's still a lot of research that needs to be done on the, on the biology of those corals, so we can, uh, we can, uh, produce them for in large quantity through sexual reproduction. Okay, so uh, that's from Australia, you know, from what I hear, uh, that's what I like with Australia. Actually, you know, something is happening, you know, I mean, they had some issues, they deal with them and, uh, and they find solutions. So uh, change are coming, you know, so there are discussion right now about establishing a quota per piece instead of wait for highly popular species such as, Micromusa, Scolinia, or torches. Uh, so yeah, so the quota in Australia was per ton, and uh, obviously, you know, the demand was going crazy for very few different species, those ones, and and collectors were transforming basically tons of um, very diverse coral reef into a bottleneck of three, four different species. You know, so so this didn't work. So they tried to find solution and and start to put quota per species per pieces on certain species. So the Australian industry is moving forward towards more sustainability, you know, so that's, uh, that's the best way to last longer. So uh, I, I wish, you know, it could be the same in Indonesia too. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the fish industry. Uh, Fish are still popular, even though under blue LED, you know, they don't look really great, uh, but they're still popular. So um, there is few things that people need to know, you know, in, uh, in Indonesia. In Indonesia, for example, the export price are basically the same as 20, 30 years ago. When I came here, the price were set. And until now, the prices haven't changed. Even though all the costs all the cost of life has exploded over 30 years. So what is happening is a large professional company are disappearing because it's just too costly to run a fish business uh, properly. And you don't make money, you know, actually, if you run a fish business properly uh, because the export price are just too low. Uh, so basically what is happening, so all those big companies which were working uh, out of Indonesia, they are replaced slowly by slowly by small middlemen exporters with very uh, basic facility and very low cost. Uh, so uh, the equipment and the quality is going down. Uh, to get the fish, you need to go further and further out because there is because of climate change and overfishing and all the other reasons why uh, the ocean is, uh, is destroyed right now, uh, people have to go and get the fish further and further out. So the cost of fish is going through the roof and, uh, and uh, the export price doesn't go up. So there is no way to make money. You know? So fish are like hot potatoes. You know? So the only way to actually survive in that business is to have a high turnover. So it's just to get the fish in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. If you keep the fish for a little bit, you're not equipped. Uh, it's very difficult to handle thousands and thousands of fish with different, different species, different requirements, different feeds, different this. It's impossible to, uh, to properly uh, maintain the quality you know, over a large quantity of fish you know, with very uh, uh, reduced uh, equipment. So, yeah, so that's the situation, you know, regarding fish, you know. Cyanide. Uh, 
in the last few years, you know, the, the, the problem of cyanide has been uh, becoming a uh, discreet, becoming uh, nobody talk about it. Uh, there is no news on testing. Uh, there is not really any training of collectors apart from the one made by RVS in the Philippines. Uh, when I talked to uh, collectors, you know, they told me they cannot even afford cyanide anymore. You know, they have to use other chemicals, you know, so you don't want to know. I mean, I don't want to know, you know, what, uh, what chemical they're using. Uh, they're breaking calls because they cannot afford cyanide. Uh, and sometimes it's, yeah, it's, uh, there, is, there is a lot of things going on regarding fish and, and nothing is done at the moment, you know, to, uh, to solve those problems. But the good news is that uh, there is uh, an ever bigger part of uh, captive bred fish available on the market. There is more and more fish. So the list of captive bred species keep on getting longer. So uh, it's hard to say, you know, I mean, uh, I don't think, you know, uh, captive breeding should completely replace wild one. There is some fish like uh, damsel fish that, uh, uh, the cost of breeding will be way too high uh, to actually replace them. And uh, it actually uh, provide a source of income for a lot of fishermen in uh, remote areas, you know. So I don't think, you know, uh, all the fish should be replaced by uh, captive breeding, but uh, it should be a nice mix. Um, unfortunately, uh, re-regulating white collection gives chance to captive breeding. We see what's going on in Hawaii. So uh, as soon as there is a risk to clothing the fisheries, then uh, it becomes financially uh, viable to actually uh, work on, uh, on the production of uh, captive bred yellow tang in this, in this example. So now captive bred yellow tang are becoming more and more available and the quality is getting better and better. So it's, uh, it's unfortunately that the, the ban in Hawaii uh, uh, created an opportunity for captive bread. Uh, so uh, it should be, um, we shouldn't be waiting for regulation to come. Uh, we should be regulating ourselves, this industry, before uh, bureaucrats start to do it for ourselves. Because when they start to do this, they don't do it in a proper way, and we are the first one to, to lose. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's no point to wait for regulation to come. It's our responsibility to actually regulate ourselves and regulate this industry before they do it for ourselves. Um, I just uh, saw that uh, some big players start to invest in captive breeding. So like uh, in Europe, uh, De Jong is, uh, is as invested as in all naturally. So there is more and more people involved uh, in captive breeding, Biota, the um, uh, young now, uh, Mr. Su, you know, from Bali Aquarich, you know, so there is more and more uh, ORA, there is more and more players, you know, which are actually uh, Poma Labs, I, uh, sorry, you know, if I, if I forgot, forgot you, you know, but there is more and more company, you know, actually uh, producing fish and that, that's a good thing. Uh, we should just make sure, you know, it doesn't come to a cost for those uh, remote population, you know, which are collecting fish, you know, so we should find a solution so it works together properly, you know. But that's the good news. And uh, I always take it as an example because I think that's what's going to happen also for the coral industry. So I think time's up. I think we are about 45 minutes. Uh, thank you very much for listening to uh, this long rant. <laughs> and uh, I hope... Uh, it gives you a better idea of what's going on in this industry. And I hope it's going to motivate people to uh, find solution to uh, all this long list of small problems. Thank you so much, Vincent. If you have a question for him, you can go to macna.org slash questions and click on his name and submit your question. Vincent, do you have a take home message or any comments to the, the viewers, uh, mostly in the United States who are watching this? What, what can they do to help? How can, how can they do anything right now? Well, I mean, it's, it's always what I uh, don't turn a blind eye, you know, I mean, uh, look what you're buying, uh, look at the quality of the fish you're buying, look at the quality of the coral that you're buying, 
uh, don't buy what every else, everyone else wants to buy, you know, try to be more, um, try to look for, you know, things that people don't really like, but are still nice. There is still a lot of corals and a lot of fish out there, which are very nice and which are affordable and available. And, uh, and yeah, and uh, just go for it, you know, don't buy the expensive one and just buy the, the cheaper one and uh, remember you know that those cheap corn those cheap fish you know make some people survive on the other side of the world so it's important thank you very much for that i think um i'll start an aptasia tank how does that sound <laughs> uh, i'll start to produce them then <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much vincent once You're again welcome. thank you for being a mac the 2021 speaker thank you very much cheers